Today is Friday, March 1st, 2024, and you have found the Living Youth Podcast. I'm back in the saddle once again here with my podcast co-host, Mr. Wallace Smith. Mr. Smith, how did it go solo for you? Last it week? was, let's just say, it's nice to have you back, Mr. Robinson. Yeah, In fact, maybe that. after the after our musical break, you can let we'll everybody know how things went. That would be great. All right. But to uh, set up set up our audience today, what are we going to talk about? Today, today's March 1st, uh, at least the day we're recording this. I'm not sure when you're listening to it, but we'll put it out March 1st, unless there's a hindrance. It's the beginning of a month, and we would like to encourage you to consider reading the Proverbs. So today we're going to talk about a few Proverbs. Sounds proverbial. Thank you, Jake and Julia, and welcome to our little podcast here, Living Youth Podcast. Wonderful to have you, and I will say the same thing I did before the music. It is wonderful having my podcast co-host back after his long and treacherous journey to and from Wisconsin. Uh, I it was I'll admit, Mr. Robinson, we haven't talked about it much actually, but it was strange. It was a little weird, you know, uh, doing the recording without mm-hmm. you. I can talk, you know, I definitely can can blab, but still. There are times I thought, oh, now I would see what Mr. Robinson's <laughs> right. take on it was, and, and, and you weren't here. So it was very strange, and it's very, very good to have you back. You know, we have, as we've podcast together now for three years, or we're into our third year, I think, something like yeah, that. Yeah, I think and, so. Uh, At least our third season. We know. How it has become more natural to like kind of wind up a thought and just expect the other person's going to weigh in on, on their thinking about it. But uh, as to the weekend, I might just quickly mention... Appreciate the hospitality as always. Mark and Amanda Sandor took care of us in Mer- Merrill, Wisconsin. Well, was it? Well, there's so there's so many factors there. <laughs> they live in New Richmond, Wisconsin. Oh, that's right. You weren't straight there. That's right. It is the Merrill family weekend. Um, spoiler: It's not technically in Merrill. It's in Wausau, as I discovered. But it was. We had a fantastic time, and I the 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 Wisconsinites. I think that's how you say it. Rolled out the red carpet for us. Even brought in some warmer weather and the sun for us. It was, was like nice. a, it was a whole deal, and we really, really had a very nice time. It was so great to meet. You know, we've there's certain areas of the country I've been around a lot, like Texas and the, this area here, in North Carolina. So I know a lot of the border states, and and a lot of people come and go through through Charlotte. There was so you meet a lot of people, but to get an, an area of the country that I've technically visited, but a long time ago. And meet so many people that I, you might not always see because of the distance was was wonderful, and um, we just had a really really nice time. Oh, I'm glad, you know, and and not surprised. We were there a couple of years ago, I think, or so, and discovered that like their Walmart had the best beef bacon. I mean, it was just right there. It's not no specialty store or anything. And oh, anyway, that was that alone would have been worth the trip. Yes. However, the fellowship and the people and definitely the Sandors and uh, so many, anyway, it, was, it was a wonderful time. So I knew you'd enjoy yourself. Well, we found out that it's not, it's not just a marketing thing that the cheese, cheese is the real deal in Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> we had, we had cheese curds. I almost wish I had discovered, well, and I was aware of them, but had been partaking of them from the moment we landed. Really? It should have, should have been. It was <laughs> quite nice. I, I thought you looked a little, little cheesier. I'm just kidding. I don't know what to say. I was going to make it something dumb. All right. Let's focus on our topic today okay. though. Uh, so the topic is one is kind of, it's, Part of the motivation of doing this topic is that it is March 1st. It's the beginning of a month. And Mr. Ames, Dr. Winnale, some others from the lectern, and maybe even in in articles, if I were to to look, I just didn't think of it. I just know I hear it from them frequently, have often encouraged us to read a chapter of Proverbs a day. You know, even if you only do that for a month or for a few months, because there's 31 chapters of Proverbs, and at least for a lot of months, there's 31 days. Here we are, in, we just finished February. It was only 29 this year, this leap year. But, you know, so you end up squeezing another chapter here, though. You know, it's it's still very doable. And there's a lot of wisdom in that. Now, if I had known just behind the scenes, a side benefit, as we were doing the show prep, prep for this, we have figured out at least two, if not three, new podcasts we want to do, having gone through some of this material, uh, including one, because it was funny, as you'll find out in a moment, we picked a few proverbs to talk about. But in doing so, at least I did. I think maybe Mr. Robinson did too, I'm not sure. 
but there was one I was planning on talking about as a proverb, and it's not even in Proverbs. It's actually oh, right. in the yeah. Psalms. So we thought of doing a non-Proverbs proverb uh, podcast. Yeah. But in this particular case, the Proverbs are a remarkable book of real life, practical wisdom. And because it's broken into 31 chapters, you can make it a small thing, whether it's every morning or before you go to bed, to read one chapter of the Proverbs. And if you do make a habit of it, at least for a time, then you also get the benefit of repeated exposure. So March 1st, you're, you're reading the first chapter of Proverbs, and then April 1st, you're reading it again. The, the chapters aren't very long. Proverbs are generally read very easily. You don't necessarily, it's not like, say, wanting to cross, look at other cross references, say, during the life of Christ and wanting to see what different gospels say about it. It's the Proverbs often. You just get some immediate kind of value just simply reading that meditative reading, as in you read something, and sometimes it'll naturally prompt you to think about some memory in your life or a circumstance you're in, because again, they're very kind of, I don't know, it's kind of a weird thing to say, but boots on the ground, very practical sort of reading. And we've done that. We've done the, a, a proverb a day, a chapter a day kind of thing before. I'm not sure if, if you guys ever have Mr. Robinson. I I've done it. Um, when I say I wasn't consistent with it, I just mean I didn't do it month in and month out for a long period of time, but there right. were definitely times I've done it. And one of the things I found you, you kind of alluded to it is, um, I think the repetition of it is actually particularly, I mean, a repetition is always beneficial, right? But the Proverbs are the kind of thing that actually you need the repetition on mm, because it's not, put it. not all immediately obvious what's kind of in play there. And I'm probably already stepping on your lines here, but no, no, um, no not yet. The at least. Proverbs are in are to me, one of the better examples of a section of the Bible having multiple translations is pretty helpful because you know, you and I slightly disagree on this. I'm like, what's with the New King James Version and the, and the Proverbs? And you're like, look, they worked really hard to make them accurate and convey the poetry. But there's times where I go to another translation and I feel like, oh, okay, you know, that's what's going on. And that is pro there's trade-offs with, with any, any oh, translation. There are. So, and the Proverbs can be a challenge too because because they're very concise and they're very punchy. And so it's not always, pl and plus they're relying on, eh, like a lot of the parts of the Bible, but understanding of local idiom and what the context of a statement, because it's often symbolic of broader things. And so what would that be symbolic of in the mind of the mm -hmm. person who's reading it? But that said, you bet. It's also one of those things where you're less likely to, um, to see a bad doctrinal take by looking at a different translation because it really is more among the wisdom literature. It's really trying to look at life and they're trying to, now don't get me wrong, there's actually doctrinal value as well inside the Proverbs. But yeah, in fact, that would be a way to vary what you're doing. Maybe for you've done a couple of months where you've read it out of the New King James Version or whatever version you have, and then maybe you decide to switch it up just yep. a little bit. That's a great example. And I would say we're similar. We haven't done it over a long stretch of months. We've done it over maybe a few months, but then we'd switch out something. Like with the, when the boys were little, uh, I remember in particular in Missouri, that little split-level house we had uh, for breakfast. We'd sit around the table, and we would... Uh, each day we'd read the next proverb for that day. But eventually we wrote it in, we, this is only a side note, we rotated into a different book that I think was titled 50 Things Every Young Gentleman Should Know. It's something like, it was an odd book we saw at Brooks Brothers once, one of the rare times I've gone to Brooks Brothers looking for a shirt. I think I was actually shopping with Mr. Rod King of all things. And I saw this book there and I thought, well, I got boys, I want to be gentlemen. So I got this little book and it was this amazing book of 50 little things that you'd want, if you want to be a good man and a good gentleman, here's something you should keep in mind. And so we kind of rotated into that. So we, we, we stopped doing Proverbs for a while. So now we weren't doing other Bible reading, mm -hmm. but we kind of substituted for that book in the morning. But repetition really is helpful. There's, there's sometimes that the only reason I even remember a proverb is because I read it a few times when it didn't have anything to do with my life that was going on, it seemed. But then that time showed up when it did. And I was so grateful for that repeated exposure. So, yes, the Proverbs I, really do seem like something that would benefit you in that way. Well, the other thing you also said when you were setting up the Proverbs, I have found very true. And I would I would also include the Psalms in this as well. But that, you know, you may be reading through the Proverbs and like there's something about the section you're reading and you just cannot like you've never had that experience in your life and you can't imagine whatever, you know, from being in that situation, well, just wait, life, life has mm -hmm. a way. And as you something, especially if you just get older, 
something hits you or applies to you in a way that just didn't when you were younger. And so the Proverbs uh, bring out so much wisdom, but you'll be at different places. Or, yeah, you, you'll be at different places at different times in your life. And a proverb that didn't re- resonate with you will in a different time or situation. The Psalms also are like that, too, because, you know, the Psalms there at the beginning in particular is a lot of David on the run, David in trouble, David, uh, you know, right. crying out to God, help, help, help. And, you know, <laughs> maybe maybe you're, you're too young to have had an extreme situation like that. And then you get older and the catastrophes, catastrophes of life hit and all of a sudden it's help me. You know, exactly what you're talking about. I can think of like the example and feel free and go back and listen to this podcast after you finish this one. But the podcast that we did where you explained the angry Psalms, which you also did in a, a split sermon, which you can find on the Living Church of God YouTube channel. You know, the angry Psalms are, are those that fit in that category to me, like a lot of Proverbs where you know, he's like, Oh, you know, my enemies, you know, smash this. And you think, you know, you can, especially when you're young, you think, well, do I have enemies? I mean, that seems crazy. Right. Of course I don't have right. enemies. And then next thing you know, at work, this situation happens to this and you realize I, I read a uh, wall street journal article once that was calling them like a workplace nemesis or something, but I mean, just weird things. And next thing you know, it's like, Oh yeah. The guy in cubicle 26, mm-hmm. you know, I, he, well, he shot down my last four reports and it's not, he's not trying to take a spear and stab you. But yet you find this ancient wisdom, you know, put out there by whether it's David in the Psalms or Solomon, it, it does have application. So you find yourself as your life gets your longer and more rich and more diverse in its experiences, you'll be surprised. And what you don't want to do is be rushing to the Bible blindly to find, don't get me wrong, the Bible's great for guidance, but how much better to start in your youth, in your teens, as a young adult, to take this that is called wisdom literature for good reason, because there's so much wisdom God has inspired in it, and begin soaking it up. So by the time those things arrive, you're you're already already equipped. Even if you have a vague idea, like, wasn't there a proverb about a guy that that talks too much or this or that? (laughs) Even if you don't know what it is, at least you've got the the seed, so you know to go go looking. That's still how I remember them. I tell you what, nothing like a computer concordance, you know, to oh, find stuff real fast. I'm just, I'm pretty worried when the, the world collapses and I don't have my computer anymore and how am I going to ever get through the Bible? <laughs> okay. Well, here's what we've done. We've uh, tried to make this simple. Uh, Mr. Senna out there, you'll appreciate that we tried to do it this way. Um, what Mr. Robinson and I have done, and this was hard. This was difficult. I will say, at least for me, we've each selected just a couple of Proverbs. I'm not saying these are our ultimate favorite Proverbs of Mm -hmm. all the Proverbs. That's part of what makes it hard. There are so many good ones, but we just kind of decided to pick two each and we're just going to use those as an example of, of here's something you would read in the Proverbs. And we'll talk about a bit about the things that could be gained from that. And we realize in doing this, we could literally have a lot of podcasts where it's like mm-hmm. more proverbs and go and, and, and add more to those or even proverbial proverbial themes in the proverbs. Like you talk about the heart and the one, one that I'll talk about talks about the heart. There are so many, if you want to be a good steward of the heart and such, man, the proverbs are, are a guide. So, so we what, should be getting so several is, out of what this. Does that, what does that mean? And be a good steward of the heart. Well, you need to tune into that podcast, Mr. Robinson, when we get there. But the proverb that I have will at least talk about the value of that. Okay. But, ooh, okay, write this down. When we do that podcast, how about stewards of the heart? Maybe that would, is that a good title, Mr. Robinson? Stewards of the heart. I know you don't always like my like titles. Like a British royal family? <laughs> not Stuart, not Stuart. Okay. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay. I'll, I'll, I've got mine here first. I'll, I so should listen, put you first. I love your first one because I would have chosen that one. Okay, good. So, so good. like, I feel like in, in in a sense, I actually have three in here because you took a, a fantastic <laughs> one. This I love this one. Okay, good. Well, here's the first one I picked, and it's Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 17. And I will read it for you. Proverbs 18 and verse 17. It says, the first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. And I have to say, if I'd have read that even as a young person, I'd have thought, oh, well, of course, you know, but I tell you, here I am now, several years after being a young person, 
And it just continues to grow more and more true in my experience yep. that the first time you hear a, 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 some someone thing expressed, and it's like, boy, that just seems so convincing. That seems so solid. I'm not even trying to say for people that are being actively deceitful. It's just the first time you're getting to hear a case laid out and it can seem to make so much sense. And then you finally get to hear the other side and you think, Oh, okay. Wait a minute. There, there's some more thought here. So, so this resonated with you, Mr. Robinson. Yes. Huh? Now I feel like very briefly, I, I would like to mention, because I will say this, I know, so let's say 15, 16 year old John Robinson would not 100% <laughs> understand exactly the point that that proverb is trying to make. Really? Okay. Yeah. So like, here's another translation. The first to speak in court sounds right until the cross examination begins. Oh, what a I'm not saying that's better. A, that's a, no. I love that. I you mean, it's artful, one. but that is great. Yeah. yeah, that is really nice. You know, I think this is the kind of thing you see very early like, you know, two kids are playing and something happens and the other one races to mommy. Mommy, mommy, you know what Johnny did? He just <laughs> blah, 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 and just like lays this whole thing out. It sounds so terrible and you're about, "Well, I better take care of this problem over here right. until what happens until the other kid gets to come in and say, well, that's not exactly what happened. And like, but, but they, they lay out the case or what did you tell mom that we did this, you know? Oh, um, I forgot about that, you know? And how do you like my Johnny voice? Or, that's, that's okay. impressive. That's but, impressive. but like and that, but yes, 100%. And I, and one of the reasons I like this actually is more because I, I have found myself falling prey to this many, many times. It's like, you, you, and I mean, as, as an adult, I just, I'm just, I'm just trying to say how, even as kids, this already the kind of thing begins, you race to an authority figure and they lay out how they're right and how terrible and mistreated they were by this other person until you go and get the, the rest of the facts of the story and find out it wasn't, it's, you know, you needed to hear both sides of the story and that you could, you could just leave it at that. But what I have found, I have, and I have fallen prey to this many times. Somebody that you know, and especially if you already have like empathy for, for this person and they come and tell you this, this has actually happened to me a lot <laughs> and they come and tell you this amazing story that sounds like true injustice. Okay. Yeah, you're really feeling for that person, yeah. right? Well, this really sounds like a wrong and you know, actually this will lead into one of the other proverbs uh, that I like. And so you think, well, maybe, maybe I should get involved here kind of thing. Mm. Right. Okay. And then, cause I've, then I've had, I've learned, well, you may talk to another person or check up on some things and you go check up on some things and you found out important details were left out. Um, a general sense of what was happening. Like, like, um, what do you call that? Mr. Smith, you talk about when you, when you speak, you have to have, you have to speak on three levels. You talk about, it needs to have, um, Oh, the ethos, pathos uh -huh. and logos. Yeah. Okay. So there's something about the pathos maybe of, of, of the feeling, the, yeah, the feeling and emotion of it. And you, you realize, well, that wasn't quite the right tenor of things. And then you find out that the, the other person involved here actually did say something about that or did qualify their comments. And the whole point is I have had many, many times where somebody pleads their case to me, not even as an authority figure necessarily, just did you, would you know what happened to me? And I was just, you know, I was at work and this thing happened, this thing happened, this thing happened. Like, Man, that sounds dreadful and entirely unfair. You do a little bit of checking and it's, there's another side to the story. It's all, all too common. I just see, I just hijacked your proverb. Oh I'm no, sorry, that, the, hey, this is what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping for something like this. And what you say reminds me of the circumstance. I'm so glad he just came through. I was just texting my son, David, because one of those times is, is funny where you come on your children and you bet somebody wants to make their case first, right? Because mm -hmm. and you, you want to set the stage where even when the other person comes along, they have to be understood based on what you said. Well, once there was some difficulty with the boys, they were younger. And I came into the room and thank you, David, if you hear this tomorrow or whenever you hear it, that you gave me this. And so clearly there'd been a kerfuffle of some sort between David and Benjamin, uh, boy number four and boy number three. I and remember. I, oh no, that is rarer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, so I asked David and, and I asked in this case. And so he said, uh, well, Benjamin's causing problems and blaming them on me. <laughs> <laughs> and so then, and so Benjamin was there and said, well, Benjamin, now, you know, what is, what is your take? And he says, well, I'm causing problems and I'm blaming them on David. <laughs> now, but at the same time, I think I've told him that I think he, maybe he was trying to be snarky, you know, at the same time, but the same, but it's like, 
well, at least we're in agreement. We can, we can work from that. But yeah, you feel that temptation because if I can get in there first, not, I can, I can paint my whole scenario and also try to put in the, the seeds that when my opponent comes to give his case, you know, I've already prepped it, but you know what? The fact is this is true. Not even when it's just a matter of deception or something. Uh, Scott Adams, I think it is uh, the, you know, the fellow that draws Dilbert and could be kind of a political firebrand here and there, but he made an observation. I think it was during the COVID days or something. And he said, look, you can read something. One of these people write on one side of whatever issue. And it just sounds solid. Fantastic. It sounds, if, if that's, if that's the first thing you're going to read, you're instantly going to be thinking, well, that's probably true. He said, then a lot of you, instead, you're reading this first. He gives another example that says essentially the exact opposite in every way, but it reads solid and convincing. He says, if that's the first thing you read, you're initially going to think, wow, that's true. But here's the reality. They both can't be true. Now, both of them can be wrong, but they both can't be true. And yet our instinct is when someone has a really, you know, it's, it's when something is just simply clearly, confidently, and seemingly competently presented, we naturally think that it's true. And part of what I appreciate about this proverb in this time, and hopefully we won't linger too much on each proverb and move on. And I'll try to keep, keep my observation here short is that in these particular days, especially for you young people listening, cause your mind is one of the most prized goals of all the ideological wrangling that's going on out there that we can often think we are, uh, satisfying the wisdom of this proverb. And instead we're just misapplying it in a different direction. Let me give, let me pick some names and I'm not, I'm not trying to label anybody in particular in a particular way, but during the COVID days, considering Dr. Anthony Fauci, mm -hmm. said a lot or, of stuff. Or Fauci, Fauci, Fauci. I don't think I've ever gotten it right. That fella, uh, you know, just comes across competently, comes across as a professional and, and it's so easy to just listen and think, oh, everything he's saying must be true. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, maybe some become jaded for a variety of reasons, you know, and have cause to question. And then they find someone like on the other side, Dr. Uh, Robert Malone. I think that's the name, Dr. Robert yep. Malone, who was willing to disagree with a lot of those things and present completely different, you know, posi positions and think, oh, wait a minute. And suddenly, you know, you're questioning. So it's easy to just think, well, look what I did. Mm -hmm. The first guy presented his case and then his neighbor comes and examines him. And now, but then if you follow some of those individuals after that, then you find that, well, sure enough, now they're just swallowing, say, what Robert Malone says without any critical thought. When uh, you think they learned the lesson the first time, which is, wait a minute, hopefully all of this was some sort of balance where you don't anoint anyone physically out there as, well, you know, the key source, because what if he says that now, next thing you know, what if uh, the, your new favorite doctor speaks on a completely relatively different topic? Well, now he's the first one to present his case, you know, then well, what is going to happen whenever the neighbor comes and examines that? And at its extreme case, I see a lot of uh, flat eartherism with this. And I, and I mean this in the most innocent of ways. I do not mean it in a, uh, in a, in a, in a, uh, any kind of condemning way, uh, people whose, whose, uh, uh, thought process I respect, who I respect as their, their character individuals I, I've known where they could see a video and the video seems to, to make so much sense. It's like, well, how can it be true that we landed on the moon? Given these facts, uh, look at what Buzz Aldrin said you know, you're right. I think maybe he's saying they didn't land on the moon or because of the, with the context, the way it's presented and you think, well, how, how can it be any other way? But if you actually just gave an opportunity openly and with an open mind to allow the neighbor in this case to cross examine that evidence, it is in every case I've seen so far, it's amazing how quickly that evidence utterly falls apart. It just does not last. It just crumbles. And when it comes to flat eartherism, often at the heart of that is sometimes it's like, oh, you need to watch these 30 videos. You need to read these 40 articles. But what you have to do in every case is not cross examine any of them because none of the videos by themselves withstand any kind of cross examination. None of the articles actually withstand any good cross examination. However, the sheer abundance of first takes, if you will, the sheer abundance of unexamined 
first pleading of causes feels like a great weight and you feel like you've done a lot of due diligence. It's the equivalent of listening to like in a courtroom case to go with that translation, the prosecutor makes his case. And before you get the chance for the defense to cross-examine, another prosecutor comes in and makes his case and another prosecutor comes in. And then you've had like, say you've the equivalent of watching YouTube video one after the other, you've had 30 prosecutors all make their, their case with variations on the evidence with this. And you just feel so convinced when, if you actually gave the defense an opportunity, they could knock down that guy's case and that guy's case and that guy's case. And so I feel like we're living in a time given that it's prophesied to be a time when truth has fallen in the street, that this is so, this is such a fundamental truth because our algorithms on YouTube and stuff want to keep giving us these first to plead his case things. And especially if they scratch an itch, then those are the only ones we really want to listen to anymore after a while. In fact, we'd like that to be, we'd like, we'd so much like it to be true. We don't want to bother to look at anything else. And so I, I feel like this is a, a proverb that really speaks to our time. And therefore that's one of the reasons I picked it because I feel like it's got yep. a lot of weight. That's a good one. For the sake of time, I'll allow the Dr. Malone slander to slide. <laughs> hey, but... I like the guy. I'm not trying to slander him. <laughs> so thank you, Mr. Robinson for being kind. So would, so if we were to like summarize this one, well, at least this is how I would summarize it, especially for really, truly our youngest listeners out there. You can save yourself a lot of trouble for the rest of your life. If you, you learn to detect when somebody comes up, they tell you a story about somebody else. It doesn't mean they're even necessarily intentionally lying, but they come up and tell you this dramatic story about how bad this other person is and that they're probably literally Hitler. Then in a case like that, I really... You, sh- you might have to train yourself to do this, but you can should at least consider, really, is it, is it that bad? Like, is this person that bad? I mean, have you ever met anybody that's really ever that bad? And that if you can, because it it's not always easy to do, but do a little digging and find out about this other person, because I, I would say 99% of the time you find out that that person didn't have all the information and the story they painted was ill-informed or maybe maybe even was possibly malicious to malign somebody they don't like just dramatic stories about how terrible a person is should always be taken with a grain of salt. Oh yeah. And I think that, I think it's a great observation to make. And so your next one is, is one that I enjoy and have tried to learn from, but needs probably needs to learn more. Uh, let's, let's move on to yours, Mr. Robinson. What do you got next? Well, I like how you kind of prefaced our proverbs. Like I, you know, if I had to put down a list of the, the top five, Proverbs I have personally seen come to life in my life come to life. You know, you really, you you see the wisdom of it over and over and over again. The the first one you picked is an important one, but this one, this one I've learned and I've learned this the hard way, like like so many things (laughs) in my life. Okay. Proverbs 17 and verse 28. Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he's considered uh, per perceptive. Mm. And one of the things that I think will help contextualize this, we won't go read any of these other ones, but if you go through the Proverbs, they're full of discussion about fools Mm. and they range, they range from a fool. um, He doesn't listen to reason. Correcting him doesn't seem to produce results. And he talks a lot and that, Mm. you know, back into uh, our podcast, that'll be, Oh, you thought that was a proverb, <laughs> but it was <laughs> Our future else. podcast, right? You know, Ecclesiastes five three: a fool's voice is known for as many words, and you really do get that sense with the other proverbs, even if they aren't that on point. Which is, people are who are, who are foolish, and they've kind of lost something of a filter, and they're just kind of raging against all reason. I think that's another description of the fool, and they'll let you know. You don't have mm-hmm. to guess sometimes if somebody's a fool. You know. <laughs> But if somebody's foolish, but at least has learned a little something about maybe not talking all the time, or maybe there's a time it's just a time to remain silent. Um, even somebody who's technically a fool will be considered um, perceptive at least, or, you know, just by not talking, you can at least, you're, at least you're not giving yourself away as being foolish and might even be considered somebody of wisdom. And, uh, you know, when I was younger, well into my early twenties, in fact, it was shortly after I got married, 
shortly before I got married, really, that I started learning the lesson of this. This is how I put it. So I was, I am an extrovert. Um, but when I was younger, my extroversion came out in unhealthy ways. And I, I, I talked a lot. I, I was one of those people that was often uncomfortable with silence. Why would there be silence when we could be talking? And so I would talk and fill things. And then I always thought I had a kind of a dry, ironic sense of humor. And I just assume everybody always got it. And there was one experience I had. So I would have been about, uh, I would have been 20 or 21, where I realized the hard way that my constant witty commentary was not always appreciated by other people. <laughs> and I also underestimated um, how many people didn't realize I was trying to be funny. And then you went, so then when you extrapolate that out, this is a very humbling thought process to go through. You realize there's some people that actually probably think you're a jerk mm. because they don't understand your humorous intent. And you just now sound like a jerk because you know, and I, I actively began to practice talking less. And I, I even made a game out of it. I don't know if I shared this on the podcast before or not. No, it doesn't sound familiar. It's interesting. <clears throat> well, here's how I knew I was successful. My wife, who is introverted and is much slower to weigh in on a discussion, we were out to eat. So we'd only been married a year or two. And the waitress comes over and she's um, telling us about whatever about the menu. I don't recall exactly. And I'm sitting there. What, what, do we, what do you call it? Not intentional listening, active listening. So I'm really listening to her, paying attention. And then she finishes and I, I'm looking at her and I, and I have a pause as I'm considering exactly how I want to relate. And the pause apparently went on slightly too long. And my wife jumps in and I don't even remember what she tells her, but she tells something to the waitress. The waitress goes away. And I said, why did you, why did you jump in like that and, and, and talk over me? And she said, well, you were just staring at her. And so I don't know. We'd have, we'd have to get the replay on this. I don't know if I actually had stretched it out too long and it was truly an uncomfortable silence or if she was not used to me, not just immediately blurting something out. I don't know. New, I don't yeah. know what it was, but I, I very actively cultivated talking less. And then there's other principles that I would say apply to this. Like I, was, I actually thought of an article. Maybe you'll recall what it is. It's sort of like, the article that's, I think it was maybe Mr. Weston. Um, should you say something or not? Oh, I don't know if it's an article, but it's advice I've heard from him vicariously okay. from others from a sermon he gave in Kansas City where he talks about uh, before you say something, does something need to be said? Yep. Are you the person yep. to say it? And is this the time for it okay, to be said? Perfect. So let's say you take that and you apply something like that. And then you apply another principle, which is, if what you're going to say could be perceived as gossipy or, or really if you're honest with yourself, what you're going to say is really kind of a criticism of another person and you just eliminate that from your speech. Mm. All of a sudden I didn't have nearly as much to say <laughs> around here. So just the idea. And, and I think this served me well in my, my, the later years, the latter years of my life here. Um, you get into a situation where you normally, maybe you'd be a little nervous and you'd, you'd want to talk more. No, zip it. I just, if nothing else, the people sitting around you will go, well, he is very thoughtful and there must be a depth of wisdom there. You know, it's funny. I, it reminded me of an, a worldly quote that I felt I could find that I felt I could find and I did. Sorry if my voice sounded a bit funny there. There's a worldly quote that is often misattributed to Abraham Lincoln or Mark Twain. But I went to one of my favorite sources, which is quoteinvestigator.com okay. because oh. it's editorial. You got to get it right. And regrettably, they don't know who originally said this. The only reason I even say it's often attributed to Abraham Lincoln or Mark Twain is because I don't want our listeners to go, ah, oh, I, I need to write him and tell him that's Abraham Lincoln. No, there's a lot of different possibilities, but they really could not find it. They worked hard. In fact, in their own work, they actually cite that proverb as a potential original inspiration, but it's often attributed to them. And it's, uh, the phrase, uh, the statement better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak and to remove all doubt. <laughs> okay. That's right. It's a classic, right? Yeah, yeah. So no, no, I, I agree. And I, I, I wish I had learned from that at an earlier age. And sometimes I think I am definitely still learning, especially for some of us, not, not just those of us like you and me who are extroverted, but some of us who feel 
we like if conversation is uh, uh, lagging or, or difficult, you want to jump in and fill in. You want to jump in and and help. Uh, you know, conversation greases the gears of fellowship. But, you know, sometimes you have to ignore that instinct. You know, sometimes the silence doesn't need to be filled with a lot of words. And especially if you can learn the skill of not filling that silence with things you have to say but learning to bring other people out and learning to breathe others, which has the side benefit of you not, not talking so much. So, uh, no, that, that, that's great one, Mr. Robinson. Thank you for that. All right. Then what's my next one. (laughs) If you look at our show prep notes, which thankfully y'all can't see, they're a bit of a mess. Um, I went through like three different proverbs before this other one. That's another program that we wanted to do is, is more proverbs because there's just so many that we could talk about. But this one is actually the favorite of one of my sons, uh, Michael, and and I've mentioned it before, but it's Proverbs 4 and verse 3. Proverbs 4 and verse 3, where the New King James says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. And honestly, if I recall, I wish I'd asked him before we put this together. There's a different translation that he actually likes better. Uh, was it guard? I think it's guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. I'm not sure, but could you, I think, I think that that is, um, not the correct scriptural. Oh, is it, is that, is it not the right verse? I just looked at Proverbs four, three, cause I was doing, before you even said that, I was thinking, oh, I would I wouldn't mind seeing another translation on this. Proverbs four three is oh, when I'm I was sorry. my father's son. It's four twenty three. Sorry about that. Yes. That's on, that's on me, Robinson. Yeah, if you look through some of those translations and see if you see another one that jumps out, I think his was that guard your heart for it's the wellspring. Okay, of that's life. so the New English translation has that guard your heart with all vigilance, for from it are the sources of life. Hmm. Okay. Here's another one. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Oh, that's a nice one. Well, here the the picture that's being painted, and and it's easy to say heart and think of your pumping heart, and literally there is blood coming out of your heart. So I mean, not out of your heart, but through the veins and the art. So you could think of it that way, but it's clearly not talking about that. It's using heart as in the innermost part of you, that part where your mind is centered and your desires are centered, and the things that motivate you. So these core things that make you kind of who you are, the part of you that actually God, if you're baptized and have his spirit as a young adult, he's working in you to transform and to change. But the picture that's being painted is of that part of you being like a well, being a source of water. Uh, It can be like a well you would draw water from, Mm -hmm. but you know, we went, I don't can't remember what it is. You know, and Mr. Robinson, you're from Texas and there's a place in Texas that has like a, a beautiful lake and they do like one of those mermaid shows, like off to the side. It's we, we went by their one feast, but in the lake, you can get in a glass bottom boat and go over it. And you can see the hole in the ground, which is the deep, deep well that continually feeds the lake. Huh. Does that sound familiar to you at all? Fellow you sure Texan? It's Texas? Yep. It's in Texas. The reason I say that is technically there is only one natural lake in Texas, okay, which is Caddo Lake. You know what? You're right. And... That does make me question that. I forgot about that. If you read about the lakes of Texas, you're really looking at a bunch of artificial lakes. Yeah, reservoirs. Still, it does make me wonder, this might be something that's been backed up because it's, it is, it is, the main thing is this, this open source. Okay. That's the key thing. And it could well, be, Florida they, they has blocked a lot of it up so like it would that. fill up. We went, it was a feast with uh, my, with my in-laws because randomly, and another thing that adds to it possibly being Texas, but it may not have been, is ran, this is, this is years after high school. I'm married. I think by then we've got little kids. And when we watched, went to watch the mermaid show where you, they, uh, the, the water kind of, and it was some kind of glass wall and you all sit there and you watch these, you know, ladies like wearing the, a mermaid thing and guys swimming with them. It's a, it's a little act. It's a show. One of them, I was almost certain was a girl I went to high school with and sure enough, we waited and she came out and it was her, we were in theater together. That's cool. So yeah. So she here out of theater. She's next thing you know, she's doing mermaid shows. So anyway, we got to meet her and that was a lot of fun, but all the more she's a, Texas girl. So I, I do, I, but I, but I, I'll look into it and okay. let you know. So we'll solve the mystery. However, back to this. So the idea of a, a well source, because that's what they counted on back in ancient days. They needed a well, they needed the water from the well. And if your well went dry, that was a, that was a tragedy, but more than just if your well went dry, 
if your well became tainted, like if something despoiled the water, mm-hmm. if something went wrong with the water, then all every drink you would pull out of that well, you couldn't trust. If something went wrong with that well, well, that's really the same thing with your heart. And what I like about this verse, among the many things, because I, one thing about the Proverbs is, Yes, you can just read them and gain something and move on. But if you have the time and if something really grabs you, it's often worth meditating on. It's often worth turning over in your mind. It, what I like about this verse is it's not just talking about how your heart affects everything in your life, your 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 passions, your desires, your wants, your, the, the core of your personality even. I mean, how you think about things, it affects everything. But it actually is encouraging you that you should keep it because there's an active role you have to play in terms of managing it. Because a lot of people don't think that they're, they're they have any say in their wants. They don't say this is this is the way I am. It's like well no 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 things things do affect you. And on one hand, you don't have control over all those things. But what this verse is imi- is is intimating is that yet you do have control of some of those things. And in this world in particular, your, I keep saying your mind, but again, I don't mean just your physical brain, just like here, I don't mean your physical heart, your heart, your mind, there is a world that is geared up to capture that for its own purposes. Cause if they can direct your wants and your desires, they can direct your, your wallet, they can direct your money, they can direct your time, they can direct really everything in your life. Like this verse indicates. And so what are the gateways that, so, okay, I want to keep my heart. That's fine. Well, let's meditate on that. What are the gateways into my heart? Where are the entry points where things can affect me at that profound level? Well, those are many. Let me just pick an easy one. Entertainment. What songs am I listening to? Mr. Robinson and I were kind of talking a little bit of this earlier today. What songs am I listening to? What movies am I watching? Because you might just say, oh, I'm avoiding things that are vulgar, et cetera. Mm. Okay, that's fine. I'm, I'm glad you're avoiding blatant vulgarity. Congratulations. We all should do that. But still, there are messages in what we are watching. We identify. We're, we're designed to identify. The, sorry, the movies, are, stories are designed for us to identify with the characters. Let me give an example. Uh, why? I, I know I, heard, I read about it, I believe, but I know I've heard about it as well. No, no, no. Actually, a mistake. This is not in the book, but the book, um, The Marketing of, e- of Evil by David Kupelian, he doesn't talk about this story in the book, but that author of The Marketing of Evil did a, a, a movie review of Brokeback Mountain. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm, I'm just, clearly, I'm not recommending Brokeback Mountain. There's well, a reason people called it the gay cowboy movie. So to support your contention, I hope this does, as soon as you mention the name of the film, the it's little guitar riff soundtrack popped into my brain. Really? Yeah. Okay. Cause I have not seen it, but you right might be on it. So David Kupelian in his review, cause he's generally a, a mainstream Christian. My understanding is. And so he's reviewing it from that perspective and he made this great comment. So without even going into the details, cause I, I don't even want to essentially it's called the gay cowboy movie because it, it just kind of subversively tries to take this kind of standard macho image of your working cowboy, you know, mm-hmm. a guy who's really actually working as, as someone who does these kinds of physical labor like a cowboy would, but subverts that because they end up being homosexuals and these two guys are interested in each other. Well, due to circumstances, whatever, one of them is robbed of the other. The other, he gets beaten or, you know, he dies. And so the other one who's left, and this is David Kupelian's summary of the scene. It's like there's a there's a scene where there's music and he's simply dancing with I think the shirt of the mm-hmm. other person, mm-hmm. you know. And and he's I don't know if he's crying. It's a very emotional scene, whatever it is. But here's what Kupelian wrote. And Kupelian, in his heart, knows homosexuality is wrong. That God, it's 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 a relationship where we should pity the individuals involved that they don't know any better, and we should pray for their repentance because it is it is adverse to everything God wants and so on so many different levels for us. It's, it's, uh, it's an abomination in the Bible It is destructive to the individuals and destructive to civilization with that in mind, with knowing that Kupelian believes these things here, he watched that scene in the movie and with the music playing with the camera angles, with the lighting, he could feel a growing desire in his own heart 
that he wished those two men could have been together, mm. that he wished that it was, it truly felt tragic that these men were, they, they live in a society where they couldn't be accepted for that. And he said, look, you have to understand when you're going to the movies or when you're listening to music, when you're listening to the, these are professionals who are paid tens of thousands, even millions of dollars because they're very good at provoking exactly the response that, that they want to provoke. And you don't even have to attribute to them malice. The fact is you're giving over to them permission. You're giving them permission to mess with you. And you might think, oh yeah, but, but I know the difference. I'll come, I'll come away and I'll, sh- I'll shake it off. And like, oh, I know better than that. But here's the thing. The Proverbs tells you not just to, hey, make sure your heart doesn't get in any trouble. It says, no, keep your heart with all diligence. You want to protect that heart because if it becomes tainted, if the water that flows from it, if it as a source of water becomes damaged, becomes hurt, becomes untrustworthy, the waters that flow from that affect everything everything in your life is saying it's maintaining your heart and protecting your, your, your thoughts and your passions and trying to make them right and align with God. It's not just like protecting the effects. It's not like trying to make sure you're diligent at your job while you're separately trying to make sure you're uh, serving your family while you're making sure you're being good. No, this is at the core. If this gets corrupted, everything has the potential to be corrupted and you want to make sure that heart is as clean and pure as, as you can make it. So I, I don't know if that's over. Oh, thank you. No, I mean that like, I, <laughs> you never know how the conversation is going to go, but I was going to freely admit that I don't feel, I don't feel equipped to have an opinion on this scripture because I have not thought it through. I, I would have to study on it more and try to understand more deeply what it means, but you've, you've done a great job of expanding Aww. it. You're such a good, podcast co-host mr robinson thank you made me feel good about what i did okay what's what's your what's your next one this okay. is number four so i did not do this deliberately but i do believe there's a bit of a tie-in here so the first proverb was the first to plead the first one to plead his case seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him okay and so I, in my discussion about it i i, I hypothesized a, a a real life scenario that's happened to me before where somebody you have sympathy for comes in and paints a real dire picture of a great injustice. Right, right. Okay, so then maybe if you're stirred enough and and you're actually being, you are being unwise in this and you think, well, maybe I need to get involved. Maybe I need to do something to help, okay? This is a terrible idea, especially especially (laughs) if you have not cross-examined there's no cross examination. You've not heard the other side of the story, okay? Which leads me into Proverbs twenty six seventeen. Mm. He who passes by and meddles in a quarrel not his own is like one who takes a dog by the ears. Some of the others mm. bring it out. Uh, let's see. Oh, I flipped away from that. I had some other uh, translations in there. I was going to mention because they 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 bring out the dog part <laughs> a little uh, bit it, better. Even, hmm. Well, you know, just just think of an old an old grouchy dog laying there and and maybe he's not even that you know capable anymore, but man, ruffle his feathers and get him upset and he's you're going to get a pretty nasty. Well, if you think about having a dog by the ears, which one the dog's not going to like it. So that dog's going to say, "You know what? I'm biting you." Because that's what I do yeah. to people who do bad things to exactly. me. Exactly. And you can't even let go of one ear. You let go of one ear, if you think about it, the dog gets to bite the yep. arm that cuz he now he's free to turn his head. You let go of the other, he just bites the other arm. You can't let go of both ears because now he's going to bite you in the face. That's right. And so you are in a terrible, terrible place. And I think that's such a good way to articulate what happens when you you potentially wade into an issue that's really not your own. Mm-hmm. And I do actually have some ground rules um, for how you would determine that. So, for example, I, I did have somebody ask me one time about something was going on and he felt there was injustice going on and, you know, could I say something? And so I asked some questions and got a little more background on it. And I realized, well, technically, if you, if you even think of it as a court case, they didn't have any standing t- to be involved in it. Like they were not personally harmed. The person hadn't done anything to them. And even then, even then it was, it did feel a little bit like, well, both sides kind of have a point. 
Okay. But like, so the first thing I would ask myself, if you, you see a situation and you're thinking about getting involved, it's like, well, do you have any standing to get involved? Like, uh, you know, if your neighbor says something to you and we start applying um, Matthew 18 to it and you need to go to your neighbor, that well, that's understandable that something specifically happened to you. But if something happens to somebody else, it's not really your business. And then I would still argue that even if they try to enlist you into their cause, that I would be very, very careful in taking up causes that weren't our own. Hmm. A cause may be not even the best the way of putting it. It's a, it's a real caution for us to be, you know, I think one of the other questions you have to ask yourself is, what what's this proverb saying? Is it saying just always mind your own business? Or the way I take it, more of a warning about being very, very careful about getting involved in other people's quarrels. And so much so that I would, I would say 99% of the time you are not going to get involved in this, hmm. but you, you never know. There's always one situation you, you don't anticipate. Okay. Let me, let me try to paraphrase what you just said. Cause I think that's interesting. You know, there are positions in life where uh, sometimes by position or relation, it may not be our quarrel, but well, like I think of parents, you know, our mm-hmm. kids get into struggles all the time. Right. And on one hand, it's not really our quarrel. On the other hand, uh, okay, I'm going to jump in, but there's times when I've recognized, okay, I'm going to jump into this and it's going to be a massive headache because I jumped into this. And I say my kids, that makes it sound like my kids are terrible. They're not, they're very wonderful human beings, but yeah, there's times where I've, and even in the ministry, that's also kind of your job sometimes to step into situations, but at the same time you recognize, okay, this, this really is going to be painful to do this. This is going to be a headache, but you're, but yet, yet you are in a position where like police, that is literally are the police in our society. That is their job to insert themselves into some such like domestic disputes, et cetera. Mm, they, hate, they hate that. Exactly. So in a, but what, if I understand what you're saying, this proverb not only talks about the lack of wisdom in doing that, if you can volunt if it voluntarily, really, it's you're, you're jumping into something that's not your business, but it also highlights that for those who must, essentially, they've been hired to grab dogs by the ears. In other words, it doesn't really make a difference. This is still what you're getting into. And so it kind of highlights the level of pain that would be yeah. involved. So at least if you, for some reason, make the calculation that you should do that, you know, you know, the price. Yeah, that no, you're I think you've is actually that, made, that summarize. Yeah, I think you've made a very helpful clarification. Like if you are positioned in authority and, and you do have subordinates, um, sometimes it is your job to, to have to get in the middle of things. Right. But I think this is applying more, say, peer to peer, because like I was yeah. noticing the NLT, they're they're even more blunt in some ways interfering in someone else's argument is as foolish as yanking a dog's ears and i think that's another way of appropriately putting it um because yeah. you know the new king james was medals and quarrels not his own it's like a contention mm. between two other people that's you're not really involved in and you decide because you you like somebody or you've taken a side for whatever reason you're going to jump in and try to help and I, th- I can't remember if it's just this proverb or if there's another one and there's this idea of uh, I should look it up before I say it, but like sometimes both parties will turn on you if you jump in the, <laughs> into the middle of something. So that is interesting. And you know, the, I do like the way you just said the new living. I was trying to find the verse that you might be, uh, the translation you might be thinking of. And I passed over that one too quickly. And I did come across that one. Interfering in someone else's argument is as foolish as yanking a dog's ears. Well, I, I, here's some feedback I got in the field, by the way. People are greatly amused when one of us says, so as we wrap up here, and then and we go, not 25 minutes. I think we were, we're genuinely wrapping up because we've been through all our points. Yes. I think to kind of cap this off, this is one of the things I've come to truly appreciate about the Proverbs is in a certain sense, I'm still not completely satisfied with how I try to characterize this. In some sense, there's no judgment of right or wrong. The Proverbs is just straightforward. If you're going to get involved in somebody else's business, you know, get ready to get bitten, you know, to be a problem. Uh, One of the ones I considered was basically if you make the king angry, you're kind of an idiot. That's 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 the new John Robinson translation. (laughs) But but the sense of it is it's like because maybe you're right. Maybe you've you've properly evaluated something. Maybe there's an injustice. And I I always go back to thinking of these um, these. 
Persian kings. You know, go plead your case before the king and tell him how he's wrong about a matter. It's it's life is cheap. It's <laughs> off with your head, and it's like you brought that on yourself. You, yeah. you need to you need to understand authority. So the, to me, there's so many proverbs like the ones we've gone through that are just like just straight up wisdom. You ignore ignore them at your peril. You know, that's a great way to put it because I, I do believe that that right and wrong can be community in the proverbs. Um, but 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 at the same time. That's not just what's happening there in Proverbs, and I, not to add one proverb to to our list, but to give one that might that might remove a sense of, of moral judgment, if you will, when it talks about debt and how how you know debt can make a person a slave to the to the lender, but that doesn't mean all debt is wrong, right? But you need right. to keep in mind right. it's like, look, okay, when you're weighing whether to go in debt or not, keep in mind the dynamic you will in many ways be a slave to that person or that company or whatever the case is. Yeah. No, that's a good, it reminds me of something Mr. Wakefield told me once, which was kind of obvious after the fact, but it was a helpful clarification. So for example, to your point with debt, there's a difference between secured and unsecured debt. Mm. So like going into debt to buy a house isn't so problematic because the house itself has a tremendous value to it. And if for whatever reason you fall behind and lose it, I mean, you will pay a financial penalty, but in theory, the house can be sold to pay off the loan or the versus debt. something that's not secured yeah. by anything like an extensive borrowing a bunch of money to go gambling would be a good example of <laughs> that would, debt to take on. Absolutely do not do that. <laughs> no. so, so yeah, verses like that, they, they're not saying you should never, ever, ever take on a mortgage or something, mm-hmm. but they are saying, there is a price to be paid. You'll be in a precarious situation, which all the more then says, then you better go through it as carefully as possible. Like even as someone, as a minister, uh, who when you're a pastor in a congregation, sometimes that is your job to wade into this thing, which is really a quarrel between other people. And even if I'm, it's not the same as a peer circumstance, because you are going in as a spiritual counselor, I still would look at that proverb. You've highlighted and realize, okay, knowing that this is going to be prickly and this is going to be difficult, then what's the wisest way to go about it? What's 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 the smartest thing to do? Because because like when I've heard other other ministers, especially older, more experienced ones, uh, occasionally talk and very generically, it's a it's a it's a true talent of many of the ministers to be able to talk generically about something that's happened. Um, especially if you wade into a family matter, like you're so cautious, and really what you're trying to do is help them work it out. Like right. you're not trying to resolve it for them exactly. You want them to get on a more common ground. You're just guiding them towards their solution because it kind of is their quarrel. And I think that might be a helpful um, distinction as well. But no, uh, you're so right. Just listen to right. so many ministers talk about dealing with, with a family on family problem, and that's difficult, and how they waded to it very carefully. I've heard that many times. Right. But the spirit of the proverb, very simply, is you see a quarrel between two other people, and it's not your quarrel. For you to just flippantly say, how hey, I'm going to go into metal with that. I think I can fix this. You know, my friend's involved or whatever, then be prepared because that is generally an unwise circumstance. Uh, so four Proverbs for you. Uh, we're going to say actually, so here we are. We have wrapped up. We hope you have a wonderful week. I'm trying to regain some credibility. We'll get some credibility <laughs> on this wrap up thing. And uh, we look forward to talking to you next week. Say